OK, any questions about any of that stuff? So what I'll do next is talk about how the pattern, the proxy pattern is applied in Android. Uh, some of this is recap, so I'll go through it quickly. I just wanted to put it here for completeness, but I won't spend time on it. So in Android, they basically you know, implement this by automatically generated code. And um, here are some of the implementation considerations you have to think about when you're, you're using proxies. So one is, are the proxies automatically generated, like, like a robotic assembly line? Or are they something that's handcrafted? Uh, and they're trade-offs. For the most part, people rely on auto-generation now. Another question is, you can potentially use a proxy to cache certain information that is stable or immutable, things that don't change. Um, item potent, as they sometimes say, where you get the same result if you call an operation multiple times. And you can actually have the proxy cache that information locally so that when you need it, it's right there. You don't actually have to make a remote call to the other side. I kind of think of, anytime I think of caching, I think of <clears throat> hamburgers at a fast food restaurant in a heat lamp, right? So when someone comes in and says, I want you know, a Big Mac, you don't have to cook one. You just reach back to the heat lamp in the cache and say, here, there it is. It's right there. There's no need to go back and talk to the cook. You've got it in the cache. So for things that are stable, things that occur frequently, things that are worth being um, pre-cooked, then a proxy can give you access to that. Another implementation consideration, some languages give you some pretty cool support built into the language for <coughs> proxies. Uh, C++, for example, has this interesting feature called the delegation operator or operator arrow sometimes called the smart pointer operator. And basically what you can do with this operator is you can use it in such a way where you can invoke something through a proxy using operator arrow that looks like it's actually making a method call. But in fact, what the operator arrow is doing is it's basically intercepting the original call, doing something else, and then returning a result. And then the compiler generates code to redelegate that call uh, to the object returned by the proxy. And there's lots of cool use cases of this. It's used in uh, thread-specific storage. It can be used by a, a variety of other techniques for being able to make proxies look like pointer access, thereby hiding the details from the application developers. So let's take a look at how you might implement this particular pattern in the context of, of Android. Um, so this is an Android example using Java. We've seen this already, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. So you run your IDL compiler on your IDL interface, and you get stubs and proxies. The stub is basically the thing that you're going to inherit from and fill in the details uh, to implement later through, through extension, through subclassing. There's a, a bunch of helper methods that a stub has, things that are used to register the, uh, the stub object or the binder object with the underlying binder framework. There's also something that can be used as a method to convert a binder object into a proxy. So that's, you get a proxy back when you call that. The proxy is something that's also automatically generated, and you can use this in order to be able to um, <coughs> indicate who the binder is that you want to talk to, the binder object you want to talk to, and also has the code that, that marshals and demarshals the parameters and sends them across the other side. The other side, of course, ends up being a callback on a method called onTransact, and that's the guy that does the inverse operation from the proxy. That's the guy that pulls all the various pieces out of the message, turns it back into strongly typed data types and then passes them as an up call to the implementation method that you define in your subclass of the subclass. So we've talked about that stuff before, so I went through that quickly. So in a nutshell, Android defines the proxy pattern and uh, it, it implements the proxy pattern using its generated proxies. It allows you to do various kinds of remote method invocation using the broker mechanism we're going to talk about later. By using this mechanism, there's um, no API difference between talking to something local and talking to something remote. There may actually be a semantic difference because, for example, if you're talking to an object that's co-located, it's going to end up running in the same thread as the caller. Whereas if you're talking to an object that's running remotely in another process, that will be running in a different address space and that will be running in a different thread. So there's some different semantic differences to some extent in terms of where things run. But from an API perspective, they look the same. Yes? So when you're writing a proxy, do you, do you assume that you know uh, where that resource is that you're going to be interacting with? Like, Do you write a proxy such that 
it's going to always be communicating with like a remote, like uh, off. You know. What yep. I mean? Great question. So the question basically is. Uh, does whoever create the proxy, which could be a person or, or a generator, right? Whoever, whoever makes the proxy, um, what assumptions should they make about where the target object actually resides? And it turns out that there's two answers to that question. Uh, the naive approach just always makes things go through the proxy, even if you end up being co-located in the same address space. And, and I should say naive approach and or the approach that want to have, wants to have semantic consistency of behavior even when co-location co occurs. So that's, in that case, you, you don't differentiate. The optimized approach, which potentially is more intelligent, but may also be semantically different with respect to what thread context you run in. Um, in that case, what the, the, the proxy typically does is it takes a look when the call is made and it asks the question, is this object, the target object, in my address space or not? If it's not in the same address space, then it goes ahead and does all the normal things and sends it on its merry way using a broker. If it is in the same address space, it does a short circuit and it goes ahead and just makes a direct call. So you can imagine that that would be way faster than doing all this other overhead. But it also requires you know, a little bit more checking to take place. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, and of course, the other benefit you get with proxies are that you can make some changes in the way in which you've configured and deployed your system, how you partitioned your system up into pieces and strewn them around through the processes in the system without really changing the way in which things are designed and implemented. It's so what you're doing is you're deferring until deployment time where things reside as opposed to having to prematurely commit yourself to one deployment over another. And that's another potential great flexibility if you want to build systems that can be sort of auto-scaled without making radical changes to the underlying implementation.